In this video, I'll show you how to solve the Alex problem called solving a redox titration problem. So this problem is going to give us a balanced chemical equation. And the first question that Alex is asking is for us to classify what type of chemical reaction this is. Now, from the title of this problem, you might logically assume that it is going to be a redox problem every single time or a redox reaction every single time. And unfortunately, that is not the case. There are um, precipitation reactions in this problem, and there are also acid base reactions in this problem. So I don't really know what's going on with this particular title, um, but expect to see anything. Now, fortunately, I have an example of all three different variations of this problem. So I'm gonna be able to go through the precipitation, the acid base, and also the redox problems. Uh, the first one that we're looking at is precipitation. So the first thing that I wanna do is help you know how to identify a precipitation reaction when you see it. Precipitation reactions follow this really standard pattern. Um, they have two reactants that are both in the aqueous phase. And then one of the products is gonna be a solid and the other product is also in the aqueous phase. And this is just the standard characteristic for precipitation. So if you're looking at a reaction, if when you're working on this problem, the very first thing that you should look at are the states. And if you have this pattern right here, then you definitely have a precipitation reaction. If we uh, fast forward a little bit to the other two problems that we're going to look at, take a look at this one. This is aqueous, 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 not precipitation. Take a look at this one, aqueous, aqueous, aqueous. There's three. That's not precipitation. And then there's some other stuff out here too. So the precipitation reactions are super easy to spot. Now, if you do have a precipitation reaction, the next thing we have to do is enter the formula of the precipitate. The precipitate is just the solid product of the reaction. So this is a, a pretty easy question to answer. We're just gonna be copying the formula of the solid that is produced in this reaction, NiOH2. And then we don't need to answer the next two questions because they pertain to acid base or redox reactions. Now, the last question that this problem is asking is for us to do some sort of stoichiometry calculation. And in my opinion, the precipitation reactions, the, the precipitation problems, on this particular Alex problem, they have the trickiest stoichiometry calculation out of all three different types. I feel like the acid base and the redox titration uh, stoichiometry calculations are quite a bit easier than this one. So this one is asking us to calculate the mass percent of nickel in the sample. And so that means we're gonna have to read all of these words uh, a little bit. A lot of times I like to try to skip the words in the Alex problem, but we're gonna have to in this case. So this is telling us um, that we are so we've got a molarity of sodium hydroxide. It says uh, we have a 23 gram sample of fluid. So that's, I think that's going to be important. We've got a 23 gram sample and that 23 gram sample is through the titration reaction is being converted into this solid NiOH2 product. And it tells us in the problem that we make, that we produce a total of 0.34 grams of this product. So I'm gonna write both of these numbers down. We're making 0.34 grams, I'm gonna write down 0.34 grams uh, produced by this titration reaction. And that 0.34 grams is coming from the nickel reacting with the sodium hydroxide. And I can tell that uh, I don't think that we're going to be using this information at all. So I'm just going to kind of cross that out because I don't think it's helpful. So the 0.34 grams is produced by this particular reaction, the nickel reacting with the sodium hydroxide in the titration reaction. And what we know is that the original sample that contained that nickel um, ion, the original sample contain was a total mass of 23 grams. So we had this sample that had a mass of 23 grams and within that sample, there was some nickel present. We don't know at this point, we don't know how much nickel was actually in there. Maybe all 23 grams were nickel. Maybe that sample was impure and it contained less than 23 grams. Our job is to figure out what percent of this original 23 grams was actually pure nickel. And to do that, like I said, this is going to be a stoichiometry problem where we are going to be using 
the mass of that product, the grams of our solid, I'm just going to write the grams of the solid so that it applies to your problem. We're going to convert that into the moles of that same solid because we're doing stoichiometry. So when we're doing stoichiometry, we always need to be in the mole units. We're going to convert that back into moles of our original sample. I'm going to write reactant just to make it more applicable to your problem. So we're gonna take the grams of our product, our solid, we're gonna convert that into moles of that same solid. We're gonna convert that into moles of the reactant that Alex is asking us about. And then we're gonna convert, finally convert that into grams. That's gonna be the strategy that you're gonna take for this particular problem. Now I went ahead and uh, before solving this problem or before starting this video, I went ahead and looked up the uh, atomic weight and the molecular weight for the, the reactant as well as the product because we are gonna need that to solve this problem. Let's go ahead and get this set up. The grams of the solid are 0.34 grams and that is my NiOH2 and my next step or my first step I guess is this conversion right here where I'm going from the grams of that nickel hydroxide into moles. I'm going to leave myself some space here uh, and to do that I'm using the molecular weight of the nickel 2 hydroxide which is 92 I'm just going to kind of round it 92.7 grams of the nickel 2 hydroxide. So that was this step of the conversion. Next, I'm going to do this step right here where I'm converting my moles of solid, NiOH2, into moles of the reactant that Alex is asking me about. So here I want a conversion factor where I have moles of that nickel hydroxide down on the bottom and I'm converting into moles of the nickel ion, the reactant on top. And that conversion factor is gonna be the stoichiometric coefficients from the balanced equation, which um, both of them have a stoichiometric coefficient of one. So nothing is gonna be ha happening there mathematically. And then my last step is to convert moles of my reactant into grams. And so here I want the moles of the nickel two plus ion down on the bottom and the mass of nickel, I'm going to round that to 58.7 grams of nickel. So again, what we're doing here is calculating from the 0.34 grams produced, how much pure nickel was actually in this sample. I'm going to need to use the calculator for all of this. 0.3, what I'm doing now is just carrying out all of this math. 0.34 divided by 92.7 times 58.7 is 0.215 grams of nickel 2 plus. Now that is not the answer to the question. The question is asking what is the mass percent of nickel in the sample and all of the precipitation reactions that I looked at they were asking the same type of thing. So this is going to be the grams of my nickel divided by the mass of the sample. And then of course you need to multiply by 100, 100 to make it a percent. The mass of my nickel is 0.215. The mass of my sample, 23 grams. These are both grams. We're gonna multiply it by 100 to make it a percent. And that's gonna give me uh, Alex wants two significant figures, so that's going to be 0.94%. And like I said, I feel like this, um, the, pre the, the stoichiometry part, the last question on the precipitation problem is the hardest out of all three different versions of this problem. Let's go take a look at the next one. So the next problem that we're looking at is, uh, this is an acid-base reaction. Um, I'm just going to tell you that right off the bat. And how are we going to be able to tell that it is an acid-base reaction? That's one of the tricky parts. Identifying an acid-base reaction is a little bit harder than identifying precipitation reaction. But what we're going to be looking for is the transfer of a hydrogen 
from one reactant to the other. So if we take a look at this reactant and also this reactant as well, and we follow both of them through the chemical reaction. So if we say HCl, what is that gonna turn into? It's gonna turn into Cl minus. CO3, what is that gonna turn into? H2CO3. How do I know that? I'm just kind of matching up sort of what makes sense. Does CO3, is it more likely that it's turning into H2CO3? Or is CO3 more likely to be turning into Cl minus? Like that doesn't make sense. There's totally different atoms there. So we're looking at what's happening in this course of this reaction. And we can see that the HCl turns into H to Cl minus by losing a hydrogen. The CO3 two minus turns into H2CO3 by gaining a hydrogen. So if we have hydrogen atoms being moved around, then that's how we know we're looking at an acid base reaction. Now, if it's an acid base reaction, we're going to answer the third question. What is the formula of the substance that is acting as the base? So one of the tricks, one of the like fast things that you can do, maybe, depending on if you get lucky or not, bases are negatively charged. I shouldn't say, um, shouldn't say it that way. Base bases are either neutral or they are negatively charged. Acids can never be negatively charged. Acids are always neutral or positively charged. So if you happen to have a reactant that has a negative charge on it, then that's pretty lucky that that's how you know that it is a base. If Alex is asking you to identify the acid, acids are things that are positively charged. Now, um, again, an acid doesn't have to have a positive charge. It could be neutral. A base does not have to have a negative charge. It could be neutral. It is possible that both of the reactants are neutral, in which case you wouldn't be able to use this shortcut. Then you'd have to think a little bit more. Um, and then what we would have to do is go by the definition, the actual definition of an acid. The acid is going to be defined as the thing that loses the hydrogen um, ions in this particular reaction. And the base is going to be defined as the thing that gains the hydrogen ions in this reaction, and those are definitions that will always work. Okay, so then uh, our next question is to calculate the mass percent of calcium carbonate in the sample. This might feel like, oh, it's the same problem, same type of question as what we just did, but this one, trust me, is quite a bit easier. Calculating the mass percent of the calcium carbonate. Um, this is, is telling us that we have an original sample of 4.5 grams. So I'm going to make a note that my original sample was 4.5 grams. And again, our job is to figure out in that sample how much of that 4.5 grams was actually carbonate. Now, there's a reason that this one is a little bit easier is because that the data that we're starting with in this problem is going to be easier for us to work with. The data that we're being given in this particular version of the problem is a volume and a molarity of the other reactant in this case, my HCl. So what I'm gonna be doing, my strategy for solving this particular problem is to use the molarity of my HCl. I'm gonna convert that into moles of HCl. I'm gonna convert my moles of HCl into moles of CO3 to minus. Now, um, unfortunately, I am gonna to have to convert that into moles of CaCO3, and I'll talk about that, about why we're gonna do that as we go through that step. And then we're gonna convert it into grams of CaCO3. And again, you might be thinking, well, that's the same thing as what we just did, but it's actually, at least in my opinion, quite a bit easier. Starting with the molarity of the HCl, which the problem gives us as 0.16 molar, and that means 0.16 moles of HCl in every liter. We're going to multiply by the volume in units of liters, so that is 0.452 liters, and that step gets us into units of moles of HCl. And then we're going to do uh, the stoichiometry, so we're going to convert from moles of HCl into moles of CO3 2 minus using the stoichiometric coefficients from the balanced equation. The coefficient for HCl is 2, the coefficient for CO3 2 minus is 1, and so that gets us out of moles of HCl into moles of CO3. Now, the next thing I said we have to do is convert into moles of calcium carbonate. The reason that we have to do that is because the balanced equation uses carbonate, but Alex is asking us to calculate the mass percent of calcium carbonate. Now, maybe depending on how comfortable you are, you may be able to just skip this step and convert straight from HCl into CaCO3. If you can do that, that's cool. If not, um, don't worry about it. 
I'll show you how to do that there. So moles of calcium or moles of carbonate, we're going to convert into moles of CaCO3. And we do that by using the molecular formula of calcium carbonate. We can see that every one CaCO3 molecule contains one CO3 unit. So there's that conversion right there that gets rid of that unit. And then the last thing, the last step in this conversion is to get rid of the moles of calcium carbonate and convert into grams. We're doing that using the molecular weight, which I looked up before I started solving this problem. I'm gonna round it to 100 grams of CaCO3 per mole. There's a lot of stoichiometry going on here. And we'll use the calculator to do all of this math. 0.16 times 0.452 divided by 2 times 1 divided by 1 times 100 gives me a mass of 3.616 grams of calcium carbonate. And again, the problem is asking me to calculate the mass percent of calcium carbonate in the sample. That's going to be the grams of calcium carbonate that I just calculated dividing by the, divided by the grams of that original sample, multiply by 100. Um, so for my problem, that's gonna be 3.616 grams. My original sample was 4.5 grams. I'm going to multiply by 100. And we are almost done. Three significant figures, that's going to be 80.4%. We've got one more problem to go, one more version to go. So this last version of the problem um, is an example of a redox reaction. How are you going to identify a redox reaction? They're a little bit trickier to identify. So first of all, you're going to know that it's not precipitation because precipitations are the easiest ones to find. One of the ways that you can identify a redox reaction, which is kind of cheating, uh, is if you have, uh, let's see, where can I write this? A redox reaction, if you have more than two reactants or products. Now that is not like a hard and fast rule. Um, that's just a rule that's going to apply to this Alex problem. If you have more than two reactants or more than two products, then you're definitely looking at a redox reaction. Now, I do want to say that that rule doesn't work in the other direction. You can definitely have a redox reaction with two reactants and two products. Um, and you can have that on this particular Alex problem, which is going to make it tricky. But if you can see more than two reactants or more than two products, then you know that you're looking at redox. If you have exactly two reactants and exactly two products and you know that it's not a precipitation reaction, I personally think the easiest thing to do is to attempt to classify it as acid base. And if you can't find a transfer of a hydrogen, then that means it's a redox reaction. Because redox reactions, just kind of all by themselves, can be tricky to identify if you're dealing with product plus product goes to reactant plus reactant. Now, if it's a redox reaction, uh, we need to enter the symbol of the element that's being oxidized. And that is going to be quite complicated. It's going to require you to assign oxidation numbers to every single atom uh, for both the reactants and the products until you're finding the one that is actually oxidized. And assigning oxidation numbers is not something that I'm going to go over in this video because this video is already super long. And if I go through the process of identifying oxidation numbers, it's going to make it ridiculously long. But what you can do is go back and find videos. I have lots of videos on how to identify, how to, how to, uh, how to come up with oxidation numbers, because that's what you're going to need to do. So um, what I'm going to do is just write in the oxidation numbers for each one of these, of these different substances. Uh, per, the peroxide is a funky oxidation number. It's one of the rule breakers, so that's kind of a bummer. Um, but in peroxide, oxygen has an oxidation number of minus 1. Normally, oxygen has an uh, oxidation number of minus 2. So that's what we're looking at over here. And this is going to be manganese uh, 7. This oxygen is a 0. This is a 2. This is a 1. And this is a 2. So they, we're looking, what are we looking for? We're looking for the thing that is oxidized. Oxidation 
versus reduction, uh, or I'm thinking of oil rig in my head. Reduction is the gain of electrons. So this is where the oxidation number goes down or gets more negative. I'm going to write it that way. It gets more negative. And if something is oxidized, the oxidation number gets more positive, becomes more positive. So I'm looking uh, element by element. Hydrogen started at plus one and ended up plus one. So hydrogen was neither oxidized nor reduced. Um, this oxygen started at minus, this one's a, oxygen's a little bit tricky because uh, we've got two oxygens and we've got a couple of situations here. So let's do the manganese first. Manganese went from plus seven to a minus two. So for manganese, the oxidation number um, got more negative. That's really bad word, wording. Goes down, decreases, decreases. Oxidation number decreases. This problem is so long it's frying my brain. Oxidation number increases. That's a better way to phrase it. So we can see that for manganese, oxidation number went from seven to two. So for manganese, the oxidation number decreases. Manganese was reduced. We know that nothing happened to hydrogen at all, so that means oxygen was oxidized. Now, this isn't even what Alex is asking. We just need to figure this out in order to answer its question. What is, oh, it is what it's asking. What is the symbol of the element that was oxidized? So Alex just wants the symbol of the element, which is kind of unusual for Alex. Usually it's asking you to enter in the whole entire formula or something like that, but it just wants the element. It just wants O. If it was asking us for what, what uh, was, reduced, then we would write MN. Okay, last but not least, we have uh, one more uh, stoichiometry problem to solve. It wants us to calculate the mass percent of H2O2 in the sample. And um, we can see that our sample originally was 28 grams. It is telling us, it's giving us information about potassium permanganate. So that's what we're going to be using to do our stoichiometry. We are, and just like the last problem, just like the acid base problem, we're going to be going from the molarity of potassium permanganate, KMNO4. We're going to be converting that into moles of potassium permanganate, KMNO4. We're going to be converting those moles into moles of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And then we're going to convert those moles into grams of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Once we get those uh, that mass figured out, we're going to go grams of H2O2 divided by the grams of the original sample, multiply by 100. Now, since this setup right here is exactly the same as the setup that I had to use for the previous problem, I think what I'm going to do is save some time and not walk through this whole entire setup because you have seen that done already in this video. Uh, the trickiest part is going from molarity into moles, but you've got an example of that right here, so I know that you can do it. Be really patient with yourself with this problem because this problem is really long and really tricky.